Indeed, it's a pleasure to be with you and to have this opportunity to introduce the ambassador to you. His Excellency assumed his current position in December of 2003. Prior to this assignment, he was the co-founder and chief executive for the consulting group GADES, Grupo Asesor de Des in Desarrollo Sostenible. During his 10 years in the public sector, the ambassador has served in key positions relating to economic stability and development in his, for his country. He has represented Paraguay on a number of regional development ventures, including Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, Grupo del Banco Mundial Cooperación Andina de Fomento, and Fondo Financiero para el Desarrollo de la Cuenca del Plata. The ambassador was also one of the primary negotiators for Par from Paraguay that established Mercosur, a customs union with a common external tariff in which all member nations are required to tax imports at the same rates and allows for relatively free flow of goods and capital among its member nations. In the academic arena, the ambassador was a professor in the Institute, Instituto de Altos Estudios Estrategio, uh, Estratégicos of the Ministry of Defense. In 2003, he received the Medalla al Mérito Profesional from the Universidad Americana, which is one of the most prestigious uh, private universities in Paraguay. He is also a member of the Paraguayan Association of Graduate Professionals in the United States and the Centro Cultural Paraguayo Americano. The ambassador graduated with honors with a BA in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and earned an MA from Rutgers University. Throughout his career, the ambassador has used his knowledge and experience to promote economic growth and development in Paraguay and in its surrounding countries. And on a bit of a personal note, it has been such a pleasure to be with the ambassador and his wife these uh, past few hours. It's, it seems like longer, but... Um, the ambassador and, her wife, and his wife truly embody the principles that we cherish so richly here in our community of family, of faith, of goodness. And uh, I am certain that you will gain a tremendous amount from what the ambassador has to share with you today. And I would just like to also add my welcome to him. And I am grateful that he is here with us and look forward to learning from him. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Lynn, for those uh, remarks. On the contrary, for my wife and I to be this morning in BYU, to have the opportunity to talk directly to you about uh, what's going on in Paraguay, what our uh, political and economic situation is currently, what we uh, expect to happen in the future, our, and, and especially our relationship with the United States. Um, the program, the Ambassador's uh, Lecture Series program is a wonderful uh, resource that you have here. I would like to congratulate Professor Peterson for having the vision to implement that. And it's incredible to think that we're still in the month of March, and I'm the fourth ambassador who has uh, come to, to participate this year in, in this series. At the same time, coming from a, a country that's extremely flat, uh, I have this major neck pain from, from the drive up from Salt Lake City to, to Provo, looking out the window at this these beautiful mountains, and I don't know if that ever becomes normal for any of you, but it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful, and I hope that uh, take advantage of, of, of the, your surroundings. Um, in order to, to take the, the best advantage of a lot of time, because I know a lot of you will start getting anxious in about 45 minutes about your next class, and seeing as, for me, the best part of any type of lecture or presentation has always been the questions or the comments, because it's at, it's at that time where we can um, specify your interest, because or else it's impossible to, to cover all the areas. So I hope you will bear with me while I read some prepared remarks. And it will quickly become very evident that my training has been in economics and 
my, my participation in the government has always been in the financial and uh, uh, international trade part because I'm going to very quickly get into a number of, of, uh, of statistics and other things, uh, even though I'll try to uh, reduce the boredom uh, as much as possible. As I mentioned this morning, I'll focus on the current situation in Paraguay and our relationship with the United States. Before doing so, however, I would like to give you a brief overview of my country for those of you who are not familiar with Paraguay. Paraguay is a landlocked country bordered by Argentina, Brazil, and Bolivia. It is just over 406,000 square kilometers and has a population of roughly 6 million people. The River Paraguay runs north-south and divides the country into two distinct regions. To the west, we have what we call the Chaco region, which is 60% of the land but holds only 3% of the population. And to the east, we have what is called the Occidental region, which is obviously the remaining 40% and 97% of the population. So Paraguay's population density, even though it's uh, taken as a country in a whole, is not that high. When you look at the divisions, as I mentioned, um, you can see how these numbers do not reflect the, the, the reality. We have a very young population. 37% uh, 30, of our population is under the age of 14, and 58% is between the age of 60, uh, 40, uh, 15 and 64. The median age is just under, the, under 22 years and the gender ratio is roughly one-to-one. One. After the age of 65, for some reason, males uh, drop off the chart quicker than females, and I'm, I'm trying to get my wife to explain that to me <laughs> at some point of why, why this happens. Our main products come from the agricultural sector, based on soybeans and its derivatives. Paraguay is the fourth largest exporter of soybeans in the world. We have uh, important production in cotton, Sesame seeds, sunflower, corn, sugarcane, vegetable oils, among others. Paraguay is also very well known for its cattle ranching and beef production, as well as leather and wood. The industrial sector is varied and growing, ranging from traditional sectors such as steel, cement, textiles, and beverages and food, to more recently motorcycles, plastic, electrical transformers, high-tech equipment, and others. However, the largest sector in our country, uh, employment-wise, is the service sector, and that's based on a very robust commercial um, reality, which um, uh, has Paraguay um, bordering uh, the two largest markets in South America, uh, Brazil and Argentina. So there's a lot of commercial activity to, between the three countries. And at the same time, um, Paraguay permitted our telecom, the cellular phone uh, companies, to develop privately, and this sector today is larger than the land line uh, telecom sector. We have a highly competitive and robust uh, telecommunications um, sector in, in, in Paraguay. Unfortunately, Paraguay does not have any petroleum of its own. We keep looking and the concessions are being given in order to search for petroleum or, or natural gas. So currently we import all of our petroleum needs. Having said that, we rely on hydroelectric energy as our main source of power. Paraguay has two dams, one current, currently the largest in the world, which is called Itaipu, uh, the Three Gorges Dam in China when it becomes completely operational and supposedly 2011, will be the largest hydroelectric dam in the world. But Itaipu, which is a Warani word, which means singing stones, is uh, at this point in time the largest uh, hydroelectric dam in the world. And actually, a few years back, it was designated by the American Society of Civil Engineers as one of the seven moder modern wonders of the world. This dam is jointly owned between Paraguay and, and Brazil, and our other dam is about the third of a size, a size of Itaipu, called Jacireta, which is uh, also a Warani word, which means uh, moon country, and that is shared with Argentina. The Jacireta dam is still 
receiving investment, even though it's operational, in order to increase the level of water uh, available for the turbine, turbines, which will increase power generation. As both tre treaties establish that the electricity not consumed by one partner is sold to the other, Paraguay is considered today the world's largest exporter of hydroelectricity. The steady flow of income has permitted our country to maintain the lowest tax, rate, tax rates in the region and implement attractive investment promotion laws. As Paraguay, if you look at the Itaipu Dam, 20 turbines, of which 18 are used permanently and two are always up for maintenance, uh, the electricity needs of Paraguay is basically one turbine. And as we're joint owners, we have a right to, let's say, the production of nine. So under the treaties, we sell the, the remaining energy to Brazil, and in the case of Jacireta, to, to Argentina. At the same time, since 1999, we have re-implemented a biofuels program, which is centered on the product, production of sugarcane-based ethanol, not uh, like the U.S., which is mostly uh, corn-based, and more recently, biodiesel, with absolutely no type of subsidy. This is a free market uh, competing with um, petroleum-based products uh, in the marketplace. This program has permitted an important re redirection of funds from foreign gasoline, imported gasoline, to the consumption of nationally produced ethanol. In the case of biodiesel, uh, our biofuels legislation establishes a mixture of 1% last year, 3% this year, and will go to 5% next year. I find it very interesting that when you look at biodiesels, most people talk about uh, biodiesel derived from vegetable oil. But uh, our first plants, because of the important cattle ranching and beef production and meat packers, is actually based on animal fat. So it's uh, interesting, if you drive around in a diesel car, your car is burning a percentage of uh, uh, refined uh, animal fat inside that, inside that tank. I would like to briefly turn to the political arena. And Paraguay, like all of South American countries, was not untouched by the rule of military dictatorships. In our case, General Alfredo Stroessner ruled uh, uninterrupted from 1954 to 1989 for a total of 35 years until he was overthrown in that year. And starting in February of 1989, our road or our transition to democracy began. One of the top priorities of the, of the new government was to modify or actually approve a new constitution, because the previous one was from 1967, and in 1992 did so, which reflects a much more open and uh, particip participative uh, program. In the constitution, the presidential term is, um, is established as a one-term, five-year period, and we have had elections in, in Paraguay uh, in 1993, 1998, and the most recent one in 2003. In 2003, our current president, Nicanor Duarte Frutos, was elected, and our constitution establishes a simple major majority. We don't have a second round uh, system as, in, as other countries um, in the region. But in less than a month from now, actually on April 20th, we will once again go to the booth to elect our next president, our members of Congress, both Senate and the House of Representatives, and the governors of all 17 departments for the 2008-2013 period. And this period begins uh, on August 15th. So as you can imagine, if you open up any Internet page of our newspapers, uh, we're in a very deep the political debate in the moment because uh, three of the candidates are in a pretty much tied race. Uh, so these final weeks will be um, quite hectic for, for all of them. What's interesting is to mention, what I'd like to mention is the fact that for the first time in history, we have a woman running for president. As you might know, in Chile and Argentina, there are women presidents. And in the case of Paraguay, um, our former Minister of Education was nominated by our President to run in the primaries of his party to become the uh, Colorado Party representative. 
She won the elections um, on uh, held December 16th and will be um, obviously representing the party on the, the April 20th um, elections. When President Duarte Frutos assumed office, our country was under a very delicate economic scenario. Impacted by the economic collapse of Argentina, the ripple effect on our other neighbors, and the blow of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks here in the United States. Under the leadership of our president, Paraguay has undergone an important economic recovery based on sound macroeconomic policies and reforms supported by a precautionary standby agreement with the International Monetary Fund and obviously benefited by favorable externalities such as high commodity prices, um, high growth rates in the Mercosur countries, for example, and this fantastic boom that uh, China and India continue to have year after year. For example, over the past five years, our GDP has averaged a 4.3% growth rate, reaching 6.4% last year, the highest in over 20 years. This sustained growth permitted a significant, significant improvement in the GDP per capita levels, even though we continue to have a high level of income inequality. Tax revenue increased 145%, allowing the government to invest more in social programs such as health, which increased in this, in this period 177%, and education at 93% while maintaining a prudent fiscal surplus during the same period, when the last fiscal surplus we had was in 1994. External debt as a percentage of GDP has dropped from over 55% to under 28%, representing today the country with the lowest level of international debt in the region. International reserves in the central bank have increased four times the level of 2002 when the central bank was actually using its reserves to sustain the Guarani, our local currency. It's interesting to note that the central bank is now buying dollars to uphold the exchange rate and avoid a further appreciation of the Guarani. Inflation, while high in 2006, was maintained within the target range set by the central bank last year, but this is again becoming a concern for the current year. And actually, Yesterday afternoon, the, the board of the central bank uh, took some pretty drastic measures, uh, increasing interest rates in order to try to um, reduce uh, inflation. If you read the papers, Argentina is going through uh, some internal complications between the uh, agri uh, agricultural sector and the government, and this has increased the prices of food and and basic commodities for Paraguay in over 40% because of this disruption uh, in trade. And that will obviously have an impact in inflation as well as having uh, a barrel of crude at over $100. Um, so these are things that are being watched. Uh, and at the same time, as I mentioned, the, the flip in the central bank's concern from sustaining the dollar versus before sustaining the Warani, where now our exporters are very concerned because they're exporting in dollars. They receive those dollars, but they have to pay the electricity, taxes, wages, everything in Waranias. So for each hundred dollars they're exporting, they're getting less Waranias, and this is turning into a big issue uh, right now within, within the campaigns. But having said that, the stability and predictability has given the private sector security to invest, and the banking sector has become comfortable in offering new products. For example, for the first time in Paraguay, we are seeing long-term lending in the real estate sector with interest rates in Guaranias. While private sector loans are growing at its historic level, levels, setting the stage for continued growth. At the same time, exports are booming, and according to a recent study by, done by the Inter-American Development Bank, in 2007, Paraguay had the largest percentage export growth of all the Western Hemisphere, surpassing 60%. However, as I mentioned before, the government recognized that these results, while significant, are not sufficient. And we still have a long way to go in order to reduce the levels of poverty from the high levels we have today 
and especially to make sure that the benefit of this growth reaches all the sectors uh, in our economy and especially the, the, lower, the lower classes. If you look at the Gini coefficient, for example, which, as you know, measures the inequality, inequality in a country, Paraguay is considered to have a high level of, of, of inequality. Turning to the trade sector, Paraguay, along with Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, is a founding member of Mercosur, the Southern Common Market, signed in Asuncion 17 years ago yesterday, 26th of March, uh, 1991. Mercosur covers 12 million square kilometers of territory. It has over 250 million consumers of population and is the sixth largest economy of the world behind the EU, the U.S., China, India, and Japan. So for Paraguay, and as uh, Lynn, mentioned, Lynn mentioned, even though it's not perfect, uh, it gives us stability in our exports to our largest trading partners. And for a country with 6 million people where you need high levels of growth, that growth will only come about through export-led uh, activities and through economy of scale where you produce looking towards the region, towards the hemisphere, and towards the world. Mercosur did not limit itself to just negotiating among ourselves. It immediately began negotiations with uh, Chile, Bolivia, and the rest of the Andean community, which is Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador, for them to become associate members, which means that we have free trade areas with these countries, but they are not full members of Mercosur. In other words, they don't have this common external tariff, which is an identical tariff that we, the four countries that apply, which ranges between zero and 20, with some exceptions. Uh, the reason for doing this is because theoretically in a customs union, once uh, a, a, a product comes in from a third country, it should circulate freely between the members of that country. And a good example is the EU. If you've been to any of the EU countries recently, it's incredible how you can just go from one country to the next uh, at 100 miles an hour and you don't even realize you just passed from, uh, from one country to another because the borders have all been lifted. We're still in transition. We still do the import-export process between our customs, but the tariffs are uh, zero for the entire range of products. And we can get into much more detail, if you like, further on because this is something that I can spend... Uh, many hours on. I would like to make a reference to this particular case of Venezuela. Venezuela, who used to be a member of the Andean community, decided to uh, retire from that uh, integration process and has now requested inclusion as a fifth member of Mercosur. And uh, this agreement has been approved by Argentina and Uruguay in Congress, and it's awaiting Paraguay and Brazil's uh, ratification process in the coming months. I'd like to now turn to, to our relationship to, you, to the United States. In September 2003, just one month after assuming office, President Duarte became the first democratically elected president to meet with the U.S. President in the White House. The result of this visit set the stage to extend the positive bilateral agenda. For example, and within the framework of that visit, the Foreign Ministry of Paraguay and the United States Trade Representative, or the USTR, created the Joint Trade Investment Council with the purpose of establishing a formal working group responsible for discussing the commercial and investment-related issues. These yearly meetings have served as a forum to analyze a vast range of issues, such as intellectual property rights, good governance, biofuels, competitiveness, and market access, to name a few. In the intellectual property rights, or IPR, field, at the end of 2004, Paraguay and the U.S. government signed a memorandum of understanding with the purpose of implementing a concrete roadmap to obtain improvements in combating violations to IPR issues. Supported by U.S. funds granted by Congress, Paraguay created a specialized technical unit with a mission of conducting law enforcement activities as well as registering imports of the sector and implementing campaigns to deter the consumers of buying these products on the street. Over the past few years, the results of the UTE, the specialized unit, 
has, have been significant, with an impressive annual growth rate in seizures, even though the problem is by no means resolved. We have actively, actively sought out more presence from the U.S. private sector in assisting the specialized unit, and this had, has had partial success. Our last meeting was held in December in Asuncion, and on this issue we, had, uh, we negotiated a new MOU, which has come into effect and will be uh, valid until the end of 2009. And in there we have a second stage of working in ways to reduce uh, the informality in the sector. Turning to what is known as the, tropi the, the U.S. Tropical uh, Forest Conservation Act, which is signed into law here in 1998, Paraguay became the ninth member to fulfill, fulfill, fulfill the requirements set by this law, therefore receiving approval for a debt-to-nature swap. As the name implies, this agreement almost totally reduced the Treasury's debt payments to the U.S. So almost 100% of our bilateral debt, which even, uh, even though it's about $8 million, uh, this was transformed instead of paying the U.S. Treasury, those funds now go into a joint uh, committee created to administer um, these funds to use in the environmental sector. And over the next 12 years, the funds will support grants to restore and conserve tropical forests as well as protective areas. If you're familiar with the OPIC, or the Overseas Private Investment uh, Council, this is a U.S. agency which works with giving loans and uh, supporting or giving insurance to investment held or done overseas. overseas. And one of our main tasks when I came to, to Washington in, at the end of 2003 is to work with the government agencies in obtaining credit lines at low interest rates, at long term, in order to promote investment. And finally, after several years of negotiation, we were able this month to sign the first uh, microcredit line of, um, of, in U.S. dollars, which will be done through a private bank in Paraguay for $15 million. Between the April and May, we should be signing with other two private banks in, in Asuncion, two other credit lines for $40 million each. And again, this will go to the small and medium business sector which in our case represents 97% of the enterprises in Paraguay, and it's one of the biggest sectors of job creation. Uh, so this is, I consider, a historic event of being able to go from zero to basically uh, $95 million in, in, in credit lines to a sector that is looking for long-term low-interest rate loans. Getting out of the, the areas of IPR and, uh, and, and financing others, I want to turn to one of the programs which I enjoy, I'd say, the most, which is our relationship with Kansas, the state of Kansas, and I'll explain why. In 1964, in complementing the government-to-government -government framework created the year before in the Alliance for Progress under President John F. Kennedy, the partners of, of the Alliance today known as the Partners of the Americas, began with the purpose of promoting more interaction at a people-to-people -people level between Latin American countries and the U.S. and U.S. states. For example, and you may not know this, but La Paz y el, uh, el Altiplano in Bolivia has been matched up with Utah. Uh, Chile works with Washington State. Uruguay works with Minnesota. Venezuela works with, with uh, Texas, etc. And in our case, we are matched up with Kansas, and it might be the fact that maybe because we're both flat land or <laughs> involved in the cattle and agriculture, I'm not, I'm not too sure. But this, this committee was created in 1968, and on the one hand you have here the Kansas-Paraguay partnership, and the Paraguayan counterpart is the Comité Paraguay-Kansas, that over the past 
40 years have developed hundreds of grassroots projects in both Kansas and Paraguay. I had the pleasure to travel to the capital of Kansas, Topeka, at the beginning of the month to participate in the 40th annual meeting. For me, it is always an inspiring and refreshing event, as I have the greatest respect for people who volunteer their time to benefit others. In this case, in a completely different country. Under the many activities of the partnership, Paraguayan students are granted in-state status, or considered as residents of the state, which means that the public universities that have signed on, there are six in total now, grant in-state tuition to Paraguayan students. And this has made Kansas uh, a recipient of uh, uh, an important number of university students coming from Paraguay. But it hasn't been limited to that. The partners in the Comité in Paraguay have set up a wonderful high school exchange program. And I was looking at their blog uh, the other day, and you had Paraguayan students that you know, spend some time in D.C., and then they go out to Kansas. This was done in February. And I was reading on their blog page, there was a Paraguayan student that was saying, wow, it's snow today, and I had the chance to shovel all the snow out of the driveway. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, you can tell this is your first time. <laughs> because after several weeks of doing that, it's not much fun anymore, is it? And another part which I think is important under the partnership of the Americas and through the Paraguay-Kansas program is the fact that they've created the, what's known as the Youth Ambassadors Program that bring up highly qualified students of low income, which in many cases have never left Paraguay or have never been on an airplane, and all of a sudden, they're in Washington, D.C., at the White House, meeting with the First Lady. Or they're touring the Capitol building. Or they're going ice skating down there by the Smithsonian Mall and uh, the museums. And then from there they go and they spend time also with families in Kansas. Uh, and these students range between the age of seven, uh, 15 and 17, some are even younger, and for me, this is a wonderful experience. And as we were saying this morning with uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Utah, once you begin to work at a people-to-people -people level, we can see that both of us have similar goals. We both want the same thing for our families, in, our case, in my case, for our children, in other case, some other people for their grandchildren, for our countries. But at a person to person, people to people, people basis. And what's a better way than actually living in somebody's home and shoveling snow? Uh, this, these are the things that will create a better tomorrow, in my opinion, between our countries. This program started last year, and in the case of Paraguay, Brazil had been doing it uh, before, but it was, it was um, increased to include other countries from the region. And last year we had five students this year, I met with them in the embassy. There are 10. Uh, and we're hoping that next year, this number can again be doubled. And we've also worked with them through the Comité Paraguay, Kansas, so that once they return to Paraguay, these 10 can interact with the other five, and they can create synergy in order that these 15 can really do the work of 25 or 30. And I find there's no better group of people than and all of you who are still, still young that have that enthusiasm and that desire to go out and, 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 and change things and that willingness to do so. So we, we want to work very closely with them um, in Paraguay and, and with the, the Kansas uh, Committee here. Another area I wanted to mention also, again, going to the people-to-people -people level, is the Peace Corps. Uh, we have a very active volunteer program through the Peace Corps dating back to 1967. Over the past 41 years, more than 3,000 volunteers have served in Paraguay. And today, Paraguay is the Peace Corps' third largest program with over 160 volunteers work, work, working across the country in six major areas. Agriculture, education, environment, health, small business development, and urban youth development. In 1987, a group of returned Peace Corps volunteers created the Friends of Paraguay Foundation. And it is wonderful to see how this network 
even though in many cases decades have passed since they served in Paraguay, one can still, still see the love and appreciation they have for our people and country. Um, and turning to another area uh, based on, on assistance of the U.S. is the Foreign Assistance Act itself. And under the Foreign Assistance Act, Paraguay receives and has um, an office of the U.S. Agency of International Development, better known as USAID, and that office has been working constantly since, basically since 1989, once we became um, uh, a democracy. However, even though we have a USAID program and an office in Paraguay, if one looks at the funds budgeted to Latin America and the Caribbean, which reaches about $850 million, the budget given to the USAID office in Asuncion represents about 1% of that budget. And this has been something that over the years we've been talking to USAID, we've been talking to the State Department, we've talked to friends of Congress, because at the same time, if you look at statistics, Paraguay is considered one of the poorest countries in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we're hoping that the program can be increased, that new areas can be looked at, and I wanted to mention some of them where we're working today, but so much more can be done. The USAID in Paraguay focuses on four main areas, consolidating democratic institutions and practices by strengthening local government, improving the quality of an ac and accessing access to reproductive health services, particularly in the rural poor, protecting globally significant biodiversity in the Chaco, the Pantanal, and interior Atlantic forest by strengthening, strengthening the civil society, and reducing poverty by helping firms to increase their sales, employment, exports, and investments. I want to briefly go into more detail on the fourth one, even though each, four of the, each pillar of the four uh, are very important and the results are, are tremendous. But going to the, 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 the economic one, the, the fourth pillar there, in 2003, the project named Paraguay Vende, or Paraguay Sells, with a very modest budget, began to work and, and work with, with the communities in order to give them the tools necessary to export for the first time, to understand how the tax code works, to formalize their activities, to get better um, providers of raw material, etc. And over these years, this project is responsible for creating more than $10 million in sales, equivalent to 1 million person's days of employment, and also representing $1 million in new investment. Based on this success, the U.S. government authorized a second stage, which has been in place since July. Besides managing, managing its uh, own funds, USAID collaborates with the Millennium Challenge Corporation, or better known as the MCC, to administer the funds included in our approved threshold program. For those of you not familiar with the MCC, this U.S. government agency was created in 2004 as a new way of designating foreign assistance. Based on three main categories, ruling just, justly, investing in people, and economic freedom, the MCC util, utilizes data developed by third parties in over 16 indicators to rank the selected country. Each country is then issued a scorecard with its comparative score and its ranking. In order to qualify, the country must be above the medium in the majority of the indicators. But nevertheless, the board approved the creation of a threshold program designed to help countries that were showing proper tens, trends but had not yet qualified. This was the case of Paraguay in 2004, which then became one of the first countries to be invited to present a threshold program, and this was approved in 2006 with a value of $35 million, being one of the largest uh, programs uh, approved by the board of directors. And of course, the most comprehensive, as it involves the three branches of government and over 28 institutions under two main pillars, combating corruption and impunity and promoting the formalization of the economy. Based on these solid results obtained over the past, almost past two years, the Board of Directors, during the annual meeting last year, in last December, 
invited Paraguay to present a second stage threshold program as the current one is concluding the semester. And the outgoing government has left this task to the transition team, depending on whoever wins April 20th as the new government comes into power August 15th. During the transition period, the, the new staff will be working on the priorities for this, this following program. I would like to, to now turn to, to discuss briefly trade between our two countries. Unfortunately, trade between the U.S. and Paraguay is limited in scope and very lopsided to our disadvantage. According to the U.S. ITC, our exports to the U.S. climbed 30% last year, but the figure is still small at $66 million. Imports from the U.S. surpassed $1.1 billion, which implies that for every one U.S. dollar in goods that we export, we're importing 20. Having said that, I would like to mention that because of the concentration of our exports, the U.S. market is very important for two, uh, principally two sectors, which is sugar and wood products. These two sectors account for almost two-thirds of total exports, and Paraguay, something you might not know, is the second largest exporter of organic sugar to the U.S. In the case of our imports, more than 80% originates from two sectors. So the concentration of U.S. exports to Paraguay or Paraguayan imports from the U.S. is also very much focused on two sectors, which is IT and general consumer electronics. Even though Paraguay does not have a bilateral trade agreement with the U.S., we benefit from the generalized system of preferences. Under the GSP, last year, 60% of our exports entered the U.S. market free of tariffs. We have, we have been following closely the developments in Congress concerning the ATPDA extensions, the approval of the U.S.-Peru free trade agreement, as well as the pending Panama and Colombian free trade agreements. And I don't know how many of you were here at the beginning of the month when I think Charles Shapiro and your U.S. ambassador to Ecuador, Ecuador were discussing these things. And this is a great thing of the Internet, is the fact that I was able to watch that lecture uh, in my office in D.C. Uh, and it's fabulous, and I, I was coming to, to Corey the, the, the importance of, of this type of resource for everyone. During the current administration, we've also been working closely with our private sector to regain access to the U.S. beef market. So far, Paraguay has undergone two pre-audits to pave the way for approval from the corresponding U.S. agencies later this year. Once approved, we believe that this sector can help to partially reduce the trade deficit with the U.S. Before concluding and opening up the floor to questions and or comments, I would like to briefly summarize the situation of three crucial and core areas. Drug trafficking, trafficking in persons, and human rights. On the issue of the fight against illicit drugs, in September 2007, Paraguay was certified by the U.S. government for the eighth consecutive year. Last year, the Senat, which is the, uh, the agency uh, responsible to combat illicit drugs, in close cooperation with international law enforcement agencies, disrupted transnational criminal networks and made record seizures of marijuana and cocaine, as well as 170 arrests in the drug-related crimes. Two alleged criminals were extradited to Argentina and Brazil. In addition, important reforms have recently been made to the penal code, significantly aiding in the prosecution of persons sus suspicious of money laundering and allowing for sentences for up to 10 years in prison. The Paraguayan government is making significant efforts to fight trafficking in persons. A clear example is that the government has cooperated with neighboring and destination countries to disrupt, disrupt trafficking networks, investigating 18 international trafficking cases in 2006, and establishing, with the help of the U.S. government, a shelter and hotline for victim, victims. Just recently, on March 10th, the International Women of Courage Award was conferred upon Cynthia Bendling, a Paraguayan citizen, by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, a privilege that Mrs. Bendling shares with only seven other women from around the world who have shown exceptional courage and leadership in advocating for women's rights. Regarding the global fight against terrorism, in 2001, the government of Paraguay proposed the creation of a 3 plus 1 group comprised of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay on the one hand, and the United States. This group meets once every year and focuses on the prevention of, financing, of the financing of terrorist activities from the tri-border area. 
Specialized meetings are also held among governmental authorities in all four countries to share information and coordinate efforts aimed at to fighting transnational crimes. Paraguay meets international standards for human rights. Its citizens enjoy freedom of expressions, expression, including the press, speech, and religion. All persons suspected of crimes have the light, right to legal representation. The national constitution guarantees the right of privacy and protects, protects private property. Paraguayan workers have the right to unionize, protest, and strike. Paraguayan, uh, furthermore, the Human Rights Bureau and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs coordinates an interagency roundtable on issues related to human rights and trafficking in persons, which meets regularly. The roundtable serves as a forum for human rights for government officials and domestic and international NGOs. To finish up, I wanted to close mentioning that Paraguay and the U.S. enjoy a robust agenda, and during the current administration, milestones have been set in levels of assistance, commerce, and cooperation. There is no doubt that more can be done, and in my opinion should be done, to solidify the relationship, building upon the measures already implemented, and again, meeting at a, a state level, visiting Utah, this is such a great way to maximize our efforts in reaching out to the U.S. business community, to universities, to the public sector, in order to find better ways in jointly developing in such a globalized world. Thank you very much. The ambassadors agreed to take a few questions. If we'd ask you to come over here to this side and form a, uh, a line, and just tell us your name and what you're studying, where you're from, and then uh, ask your brief question. We just have a few minutes remaining. Any, that, any who would like to ask a question? In a minute that we have left, I'll try to, to explain, but the, the main impact has been the uh, devaluation of the dollar. Uh, if you look at the dollar today, it's hit again a historic high with the euro and with the yen. It's at 1.58 with the euro. So this depreciation of the dollar, as I mentioned, is creating tremendous pressure on our local currency because all, all of our exports and commodities are sold in dollar terms but the uh, wages and everything else is paid, paid in local currency. We have sectors that today are saying that if the dollar drops any more, uh, they will lose uh, any profit they have um, in the export market. To give you an example, in the past three months, our Warani has appreciated 10%. And anybody who's ever exported 10%, a lot of times, is your profit. So the fact that you're losing that in the exchange rate, uh, at best you're, you're maybe working for free to get by this, this issue. Uh, other than that, it, it has to a certain extent benefited Paraguay uh, because the Federal Reserve, seeing the need to um, make it easier for homeowners to pay their loans, has dramatically dropped the interest rates. Um, it had gone from 5.25, where I think now it's at 2.25. So this, for the people who have adjusted loans, uh, mortgages, it will lower their rates. In the case of Paraguay, as our international debt, the interest rates have a positive relationship with the international LIBOR uh, interest rate also. This should drop uh, debt payments um, from, from our country. I'd say those are the main, main two areas. And, of course, the, the global effect is if this credit crunch will lead the U.S. to a recession. And we mustn't forget that the U.S. continues to be one-third of world economy. And any slowdown in the U.S. will have a, a ripple effect, uh, even though China and India especially have, uh, have um, 
really gotten to a point of compensation of that, uh, uh, of what could be a recession in the U.S. It's a very good question. It's one that's being, as you mentioned, hotly debated in, in the political arena and something that Brazil, the foreign minister, has come out in the past few days to say that they were unwilling to re renegotiate uh, these tariffs but are willing to look at other ways that they can help with the development of Paraguay. Uh, one of them can be by giving uh, investment incentives for Brazilian companies to invest in Paraguay. The case of Itaipu, what happens is, as I mentioned, this treaty uh, which creates Itaipu but binacional, so it's, it's a separate entity, established the dollar amount that par Paraguay leave, uh, receives for the electricity not used and sold to Brazil. What's happening today is that the difference between what we receive as a royalty and what Brazil or Electrobras the Brazilian uh, electrical company then charges private consumers, there's a wide gap. A and uh, the candidates and the government feels that there should be a way to, to try to increase uh, what, that, um, what that level is, is, is paid. However, you need two, for any negotiation, you need both sides to agree upon it. And, and I'm, I'm sure that the new government will continue to put pressure uh, diplomatically uh, with Brazil as our most important trading partner uh, in, in looking at ways where this can be um, resolved to satisfaction of both sides. Yeah, well, uh, Asuncion and Gran Asuncion is home to basically one-third of the population. The other big cities, and not by coincidence, happen to be across the border from Brazil and across the border from Argentina. As the Argentine economy grows and does well and has been growing at over 8%, the Paraguayan side is also benefiting and in the same situation with Brazil. What we're seeing is that there's been internal migration going from the, the central departments to these cities uh, looking for better opportunities. And unfortunately, a lot of times, these people end up going into the informal sector. And that is why it's so important to create the, the, the framework necessary to promote investment, to create formal jobs, and give people opportunities in order to develop. In Asuncion, I don't know if you had the chance to visit uh, Ciudad del Este and Encarnacion, but those, those are number two and number three cities uh, in, the, in the country. <laughs> 